Okay. Well, welcome to the MSRD orientation. I'm uh, Dr. Fred Forgey, the director of the program. This is Dr. Thomas Schwarzer, one of the uh, uh, other full-time professors in the program. We've got a couple of other folks that aren't here that are um, adjunct faculty that teach our, a couple of our law classes and one of uh, our financial analysis courses. Um, what we're going to do real quick is just kind of go around the room, give everybody a chance to just sort of introduce themselves real quickly, give us the, you know, 30 second sort of elevator pitch about who you are and kind of uh, why you're here. And then after we do that, then we'll kind of get started with the, the formal agenda. Okay, and then, so we'll start with Dara. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Derek Cotton. Um, I am a student of the MSRD program. Um, I have completed my first year. Um, and what else do you want me to talk about? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously your, your sort of career aspirations, obviously you're looking into law school, writing other things. Right. I am a um, litigation paralegal that deals with uh, homeowners insurance claims and residential, homeowner, um, residential commercial properties. I look forward to law school after I'm done with this program, and I want to put them together in my law degree and development, and <laughs> I hope I have a great outcome. Um, if you guys need anything, let me know, and um, that's me. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Marcella Div. Um, I'm also a student. I started in January this year, uh, so I'm almost like halfway done. Uh, the program is really good. I actually work for a real estate developer, and a lot of the stuff that I do at work, I can relate to what I've learned, and a lot of the stuff that I learn, I have been putting in action at work. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Erica Batanti, and I am a real estate agent in Fort Lauderdale. I am currently a first grade teacher, and um, it's not the field for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi everybody, I'm Brandon Bell. Um, I just graduated Florida State in May. Um, I currently work for Landmark Custom Homes in Broward, and I'm trying to um, get out of this program as much as I can in real estate, and I'm gonna be starting next week. Hi everybody, my name's John O'Hare. I'm a practicing attorney in Boca Raton, Florida, and I do real estate litigation in around the area of the defense on the homeowner side and I wanted to transition over here as a real estate so this is actually my fourth graduate program here at NOVA. Uh, I did my law degree here, my MBA here, the resource management here, so I started the NSRED program in January. So I want to get into either land use law or something that maybe transition right to development and so it's just another area in my law practice. So I do if anyone has any questions on the other side we have to answer. Excellent. Right. How's it going? I'm Brian Kaufman. I'm the program recruiter and graduate assistant for the MSRED program. Some of you may have met RJ. If this is your first uh, first day here, you've not, so no expectations. He did a great job. I hope to fill his shoes as your resource for anything you need as a kind of liaison between the faculty here. I'm also uh, starting the program next week. Um, I will be sending you guys a whole bunch of awesome emails to give you only good information. I'll put throughout the corny jokes and all the things that your grandma would send you and only opportunities, door openings, and conferences that I think are, are valuable. My background's in finance from Florida Gulf Coast University. I hope to kind of use this program to build upon that and potentially enter the private equity space. Uh, but initially, I'd like to get some broker experience while I'm in the program and really uh, start to apply uh, some of the things I've learned in undergrad and use these uh, professors as a, as a resource because we are a small class and uh, look forward to working with you guys. So my name is Anthony. Um, I recently graduated from Savannah College of Art and Design and Interior Design. And my goal out of this program is figuring out a way to be able to tie in design with development because I really, really love the idea of bringing design to a larger scale to many people instead of doing smaller commercial projects like I was trained to do. So that's what I'm here for. Hey guys, I'm Alex. Uh, just graduated from Florida State. Um, basically, got family in real estate and just trying to learn everything I can and get started with them. Hi, I'm Adriana. I just graduated from, uh, from UF. And um, I'm also trying to do the insurance claims and uh, law school and all of that. Um, and basically, my mom kind of just got me started in real estate and I just 
was really interested. Um, hi, my name is Fallon Bullitt. I'm sorry, I've been sick for like a week or so. Um, I started the program a year ago, part time. Um, I'm actually a senior property manager, so my focus is property management, but my ownership group is very active in development, so I'm spilling over into their side of the company, and so I'm using this degree to launch or elevate to like the VP track, so that's on here. Okay. Uh, my name is James Carter. I uh, left the military two years ago and enrolled in the uh, MBA program here, so I just finished in June. And one thing about coming back home for leave and everything is see that fields are now condos. Right. So now it kind of dawns on me like, hey, the real estate development is, is a niche to be in in South Florida um, and areas in between, uh, quite frankly. So <clears throat> hopefully we get a lot of this program and start with this. Excellent. Really? Which branch have you been in? Army. Thank you for your service, sir. No problem. Bruce. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bruce Fleming. Uh, this is my second year in the program. Uh, I graduated in the summer, and um, for anybody who's new here, you will learn what you need to know in the industry. Um, I've, I've interviewed for a couple firms. Uh, I'm, I'm still uh, on the path uh, to get uh, a position in the industry, but you will learn what's what's needed for you to be a, a great professional in this industry and what you need to succeed. So uh, if you put the work in, you get uh, what you need out of the program to succeed in life. And, um, yeah. And again, this is my second year. If any of you guys need anything, uh, come to me. Uh, I'll help you out the best I can. Point you in the right direction. And um, yeah, like I said again, you get what you need and what you put out. Put in is what you'll get out. So yeah, I am for one the second year uh, in the program. And uh, yeah, that's okay. Great. Angela. So this is customary where I come from. I'm Angelo Paladino. I'm Angelo Paladino. I'm from Arkansas. I moved 1,500 miles to work with a developer here. Um, I was managing a practice back home for commercial. I got an opportunity when I met him through corporate. Brought me down. Um, it's been interesting. Uh, the MSRED was a uh, unplanned, pleasant accident. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience thus far. It's equipped me with tools to allow me to further my reach and the depth of knowledge that I have and therefore, you know, thereby the ability to serve clients. So it's great for you guys that are new. You'll get a lot out of it. Really, you'll get what you put into it back. So, yeah, that's me. Okay, very well. Oh. Hey, my name is Miriam. Um, I started the program Directed me here and was like, wrote my letters and 
But I'm still going to go to law school. <laughs> but it's just, I'm, I'm just going to do this in the meantime. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm from New York originally. Actually moved down to Fort Lauderdale about two weeks ago and uh, you know, working for a developer in uh, downtown. And you know, I'm really excited about this program, uh, especially to dive in on the finance side. Um, but before this, I was working in tech, um, although I have done some work in real estate as well. And uh, look forward to meeting all of you. Hi, my name is Meldrick Passmore, I go by Mel. Um, I start school next week, like most of us, but um, I got over 20 some years in construction as a carpenter. And so I wanted, and I just graduated from Everglades University in construction management, so I kind of wanted to get into the development side, so that's my okay. Perfect. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Isabel Charles. Um, I studied NOVA last semester actually. Um, I completed three classes. I'm almost, I mean, I'm almost done with my online class right now. Um, so far the program has been great. A lot of, it, it's a lot, it, it was a lot hands-on than I thought it would be. Um, I'm new, sort of new to real estate. I have my bachelor in international business management from University of Phoenix. Um, but I really wanted to take my career um, up a notch and then I really wanted to I did a lot of study and then uh, my husband suggested why not real estate so I started digging in and then I found a program in Nova is one of the best in the, in, the, in, the, in the state so here I am so um, I should be done sometime next year by the end of next year so far I like it and um, and I like the <clears throat> the different aspect of real estate. So I'm here to learn and then to um, meet a lot of you and then to network and then to see what the future leads. Awesome, thank you. Um, Nathan Johnson, um, uh, retired Marine Corps. Uh, I work for the U.S. State Department. Uh, I have a master's already from Nova. Uh, uh, organizational leadership okay. from a few years ago. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, uh, as in the State Department, I'm a general services officer, so I'm the part of the general services officer job is to be the real property manager. So I'm leaving Malta now as the GSO there. I had 22 uh, properties that I managed, wrote the leases for, and all that stuff. And uh, coming back to South Florida at our regional center here in Fort Lauderdale, I decided to maybe go to school, use my GI Bill uh, to help, which covers that. Awesome. And uh, this is the, it lined up perfectly, weekend classes and all that stuff. So. Great. All right, well, welcome everybody. All right, so let's kind of go through our little uh, agenda here. Um, one of the things that I provided you, I think on the, on the uh, one of the handouts is actually the schedule for this next year, um, maybe on the back side of uh, the student list, okay? And we just kind of, give you a few comments about the schedule for those of you that aren't familiar with it. Some of you that are obviously are in the program, you already understand it and how it works, that sort of thing. Pretty much all of our ground courses, the ones that are taught face-to-face, -face, are basically eight weeks in duration. All right, so starting this next week on Saturday, you will have Dr. Thomas Wurzer all day for if those of you that are going through full-time. You'll have him in the morning for the Geographic Information Systems course, and then in the afternoon for the land use planning course. And then if you're taking the online market analysis course, then you will also have him for that. But that course runs online for the entire semester for 16 weeks, whereas the other two classes are both done in eight weeks. Okay, does everybody understand that? And uh, the classes obviously begin at eight o'clock in the morning, and then the, the morning class is done at noon. Take about a 30 minute lunch break, grab a sandwich or whatever from Einstein's or bring something with you, and then we start back up at 12.30 and then run until 4.30, and then we're done for the day. Okay, does that make sense? Then the second half of the fall semester, then you'll be seeing me. So I will come in the second half of the fall sometime in October, it looks like October 20th, and you'll have me for eight weeks. I'll be teaching the real estate finance course in the mornings, and then the real estate financial modeling course um, using Excel in the afternoon, okay? Pretty straightforward? All right. Mm -hmm. Then we move into the winter, okay? 
And in the winter session, which starts obviously in January, you'll have me again um, for the real estate investments course in the morning, um, starting in January. Then the afternoon, um, real estate law with David Weissman, our uh, practicing attorney, real estate attorney. And then you will have the real estate development software course using Argus with Dr. Thomas Wurzer, and that will be an online course, okay? Once again, for the full 16 weeks. Then the second half of the winter, winter term, you'll have the first piece of the real estate development process course which is pretty much the intro to the development process and kind of getting you familiar with a lot of, of terminology, or familiar with a lot of the specific processes that you need to develop a feasibility study and also introduction to a wide variety of our advisory board will be coming in as guest speakers within that course, okay? Then the second half of that day will be kind of a hybrid course um, which you can talk about a little bit, which is our real estate construction class. Um, and that course is a mixture of site visits as well as online materials and, and, a, and, and some lectures, okay? Then now the summer comes, and in the summer, we have Professor Sam Miguel, who has taught for us, actually he's been here longer than I have. He came, I think, in 2009, I came in 2013. Um, and he is a, uh, uh, certified public accountant, um, has a background as one of the chief financial officers for Kadena, um, one of the major developers in Miami. Uh, he, uh, uh, amazing guy. Uh, those of you that have already taken him for class, you know that, I mean, his class is intense, um, but it's, it's a really, really good course. So you'll have that the first um, eight weeks of the summer. And then also, Simultaneously with that, you'll have a land use regulation course with Peter Hinn, another one of our amazing adjuncts. Um, those folks that took him this summer, I mean, you know, have, I'm sure nothing but great things to say about him. Uh, and that'll, that'll be taking place then. Now, the part that's a little bit different this year, so those folks that kind of are at different points in the program, um, we have moved the Real Estate Development Process 2 course into the summer, and it is now a hybrid course. Now, I'm gonna be directing that course this is going to be a project course. And um, at, in, in essence, at the end of the summer, you will be presenting your development proposal to a wide variety of industry folks. So it won't be just me, it won't be Wurzer, it'll be basically members of our advisory board and other members in industry, typically about seven or so different industry folks. And they will give you honest, critical feedback, okay, as to what you did well, what you didn't do well, how you can improve, that sort of thing. But it is truly a great experience, and anyone who has been through that can tell you, you get a lot of really, really, really great feedback. Not that that's the only place you can get that sort of feedback, but that is one of the places where you really do get um, a tremendous amount of industry feedback. Now, also happening at that same time, you will be formally doing your electronic portfolio, which we're going to talk about here just for a couple of seconds. Every student in the program is required to do an electronic portfolio. Now, for those of you that have never heard of electronic portfolio, it's basically an online resume, okay? And so this is one of the students that, that did his this, this past year, Carlos um, Carrion, and in essence, you use a site like Wix.com. Okay, I've mentioned that here on the, the actual agenda. It's a free site, okay? Go in, you can put in all of your sort of background information in terms of your own sort of regular resume, but then also, like, whoops, oops, oops that, that, there's what Marcel is, back here, okay. Um, in addition to all of that, he lists basically each of the courses that he took within the program, but. One of the things that Carlos did, which was really interesting, Carlos is one of these guys who took meticulous notes, okay? And when I say meticulous notes, you think I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. We're, we're talking, he literally, for every single course, he had a binder like that thick of his notes. So he actually posted these. So I think, let me see which order this is in. Let me see if this is the one for the real estate finance course. Um, but you can begin to sort of see, he literally typed everything that was said, every single calculation that was done. 
So for those of you coming into the program, an excellent resource, okay, to be able to kind of refer to some of those notes in addition to what you do on your own, okay? So just kind of pointing that out. But that's, but, but part of the reason that he posted that um, was, hey, it's an example of what he was proud of as he went through the program. Now, he also posted the things that I've asked everyone to post, which are any projects that you do in the program, any papers that you may write, any other sort of assignments that you may do, any spreadsheets that you may create, okay? Because think of it like this. A prospective employer wants to know what is it you've got out of this program, okay? In, in many cases, a lot of folks aren't that informed about what a Master of Science in Real Estate Development is. Their first inclination is, when you tell them I'm getting a master's degree in, in real estate development, they think, well, are you learning how to sell houses? Are you learning how to just, you know, basically build houses? You know, what is your, you know, what is it you're really getting out of this? What they fail to understand is, no, this program is all about the financial analysis, it's all about the market analysis, it's about the site analysis, it's about the regulatory analysis, and everything sort of pulled together so that someone leaving this program is going to have a very valuable set of skills that are instantly usable within the industry, okay, and instantly valuable to an employer. Now, we try to make every piece of this program as applied as we possibly can, okay? I would argue there's very little of the program, if any, that is not directly applicable in some way, all right? Because we don't want to waste your time, and we don't want to waste our time basically conveying useless information, okay? So we really do make a, a very strong point to do what we can to make sure the information is relevant and immediately applicable. And so we really do focus on skill set acquisition, all right? And that's why we want folks to be able to sort of demonstrate, okay, here are some of the skills that I actually did acquire while I went through the program. Does that make sense? Now, obviously, someone like yourself coming from a design background, you instantly probably connect with the whole idea of having a portfolio because it's a way of showing people what you're capable of, okay? You would agree? Okay. So, you know, so folks that come from design backgrounds, architecture backgrounds, that's nothing new to them, you know, doing these kind of portfolios of their work. But those coming from more business backgrounds and maybe construction backgrounds and things like that, you know, they may look at this, well, I don't know. But think of it like this. This is also a motivation for you to do as well as you possibly can as you're going through the courses. That you're putting your best work out there. Because you don't want to basically prepare something in one of your classes that's a pile of crap, okay? And then post it on the web as a demonstration of what you've done. I mean, that wouldn't exactly be a smart thing to do, okay? So really think about this as, as an opportunity to really showcase your best work. And I'll kind of click a couple of more um, little things here just to kind of give you an idea of what he did. But once again, I, we're going to be posting these all... Uh, um, on the uh, MSRED website. So in this case, he went through and you've got different presentations that he did, um, particular uh, projects, um, and in some cases, you've even got the video of maybe the presentation that he did, okay? And then each student was actually asked to do a video, and I don't remember where he put his, but in any event, it's here somewhere. Let me see if it's about me here real quick. <clears throat> yeah, there we go. Okay, so there's his regular resume. And then here, I'm not gonna play the, the whole video. Oh, well, well, there we go, not available for some reason. Uh, oh, he did tell me he was revising that. Um, but the point being is that everybody was asked to do like a minute, two minute long video of themselves talking about them, well, basically, what their skill sets are, what their ambitions are, that sort of thing. Okay? Make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. So, um, all right. In terms of the schedule, a couple of little things you noticed I mentioned here on the, um, the handout, kind of because sometimes people do get a little bit confused about these sorts of things in terms of holidays and lack thereof. 
with our program, every single week is mission critical. Okay, you can't really afford to miss class. I mean, if you do, we've got video of it, but more specifically, holidays that you may think you have, you don't have. Okay, and I don't mean that to be mean, rude, or, or obnoxious, but specifically, you know, coming up here in a few weeks, we've got Labor Day, that Saturday before, we have class. Okay, same thing, Columbus Day, we have class that prior Saturday. The one that usually gets most people is we do have class the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Okay, so if you've got Thanksgiving plans, you need to think about getting back here Saturday for class. Okay, um, and then also the way the summer classes are structured, you will have obviously the meetings for the um, uh, real estate financial concepts and analysis and the land use regulation that first eight weeks, but you're going to need to reserve pretty much about the last five weeks of August for the Real Estate Development Process 2 course and the ePortfolio class. They're going to be hybrid in the sense of be partially online and partially in person. So the reality is you're going to be here pretty much most every Saturday. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? I just want to, I want to say that all up front because there's always these situations of, oh, I didn't realize that we were going to have to be here, you know, the, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, I've made plans to go away, or this or that or the other thing. So make sure that you kind of go ahead and put that in your calendars now so that you avoid any of those sort of issues. Okay? Make sense? All right. Moving forward. All right. Textbooks. Um, obviously, all the textbooks should be available, you know, uh, through the, the bookstore. Um, but you can order them directly through the bookstore. You can obviously hop online to Amazon, you know, check out Amazon, that sort of thing, or other, you know, sort of booksellers and eventually find the books. But like, for example, with the book that I use for the real estate finance course, we use the same book for three classes. We use this for the real estate finance book or finance course, the real estate financial modeling course, and the real estate investments course. Okay, so while it is an expensive book, you need to buy it and you will be using it for all three courses. Does that make sense? Now, can you buy an older edition of the book? Simple answer is yes. Okay, there are a few minor differences and those of you that, you know, obviously you've been students before, you know that sometimes the change from one edition to the next edition, there's usually not a lot of change. I wouldn't buy one that's too many editions ago, but you know, pretty much the, 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 the one that maybe came out right before this one would be sufficient, okay? Everybody comfortable with that? And then I, I believe Dr. Warsworth was gonna mention about his books real quickly. Real quickly, um, I teach three classes. Welcome everyone, hi, how are you guys doing? Um, take a breath, We've gotta take a lot of information in today, this morning. Uh, four things. Um, land use planning class or site planning class and land, land use regulations and project design. This is the textbook. It's a paperback. It's dated 1962. Yeah? You don't have to buy the 1980 version of it, which is twice the price. I think this goes with 25 or 30 dollars. Yeah? This is good enough. Don't get the big one, the hard copy. Yeah? That's one thing. It's a design-based class. Get some pen, uh, crayons, as I call them, or markers. Target or Walmart is just fine. Yeah? I bought this big set, 12 bucks. Why I'm saying this today? Because next week, I'm giving you the assignment you need to deal with. Yeah? We are having sketching and drawing assignments in that class, because you have to draw at some point of time on a piece of paper. Napkins for calculations, piece of paper to sketch an idea. Hey, how could that house look like? How could that new commercial product look like? Okay, that's site planning. There's pretty much only one real version out there. Kevin Lynch, site planning, 1962. Yeah? And it's a Bible for site planning. Don't think, oh, it's old. No, it's a Bible for uh, our theory stuff. Real estate market analysis, you probably have received an email about 20 minutes about that with the ISBN number. Um, this is the 2009 version, that's good enough. Yeah? If there's a newer version, fine. This is the one we're referencing. You can buy this used. Site planning book, you can buy that used if needed. Yeah? 
This is brand new. <coughs> Cheers book. Yeah? Brand new. November 2017. That software is on the market since a few years. They discontinued the other suite of software. Do not buy this book used. You need to have a brand new copy. Why? Because on the second back page is the evaluation code for you for a 180 day software license. If you have a PC at home or a laptop, PC based laptop, you can use this for half a year for your studies, not just the ones we have in the computer lab. Again, this book, available in a bookstore, do not buy it used. Yeah? I cannot give you a, a license so you can do work at home. I have a full computer lab, but that's the next bullet point here. On other note, there are certain available outlets like online, Amazon or something like this, where this is on sale right now. At least on Tuesday evening it was down to 60 bucks rather than 100. So you might want to check variations of outlets to save a few bucks. Do not buy this as a used book. Is that clear? And you will need it. You will, it's like, I could say it's like a comic book, screenshots of um, the software we're using. You will have to go through like reading it or doing it yeah? at home and we catch up in class because I teach you two different software systems every Saturday morning for eight weeks. Workload is going to be demanding, but very little theory. It's all applied. <coughs> yes, please. Does it work with Mac? No. Mm -hmm. If you have an Apple product computer, it will not work on that. You can run it on parallels or X-boot systems or something like this. I have 35 computers in the computer lab available with extra study time for you guys. Um, find a friend with a laptop you can borrow for some time. Um, it's doable without having a PC and using the classroom capacity. The capacity. So, how many people just have Macs? Just out of curiosity. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'm so glad I have a computer lab for you guys. <laughs> brand new licensing since yesterday. All right, that's about it for the books for this semester. Uh, the other classes you get info uh, in December. Welcome on board. Okay. Um, one thing I, I obviously skipped over, I didn't mean to, um, on the back side of the, uh, the schedule is a listing of all of our currently enrolled students in the MSRD program. So obviously we've got about 40 students currently enrolled as of this morning. And so what I gave you was not only their names, but also their NOVA email addresses, and then which courses they are specifically enrolled in this term. So that way, as you begin to kind of want to reach out to some of the folks that are, you know, in the same classes that you are, and you know, begin to think about who do I want maybe on a team or, um, you know, to be able to get together, whatever. This is your sort of way of being able to do that. Now, while I'm on this sheet, one other thing to sort of point out about emails. You really need, if you've got some form of a smartphone, and I'm assuming most of you do, you need to get your email from Nova pushed to your phone, okay? Because you need to be looking at that email as regularly as you would look at any other email that you are getting. And the reason for that is that's the only way, the only way that we tend to communicate with you as faculty members and you communicating with us. Now, you're welcome to obviously call us on the phone and that sort of thing, but in terms of any sort of distribution of class-related information, it's coming to that email address, okay? So if you don't have it set up, you know, in a way that you are constantly seeing it, there's a good chance you're gonna miss something. Now, the other little thing to kind of point out there, some people in the past have had um, some of their email going to like the junk folder or, you know, um, so just kind of make sure you're monitoring that as well, okay? Um, and, you know, it, it may not ever happen to you. That problem may have now since been resolved, but we've had that problem in the past where, you know, a student would say, I didn't get any of your emails, and then all of a sudden they look in the junk folder and there's a whole literally semester's worth of emails that they completely missed, all right? So just, you know, be aware of that. Um, you want to say anything more about the email? Emails, I will not respond, legally not obliged to Gmail, Yahoo, or other emails. If I communicate my, lang my language with about the class, class materials, you're great anything related to class with the Nova email address. 
if you bounce me a Gmail address and oh, assignment issues, blah, blah, blah. Lowest priority at all. Legally, we are not allowed to respond to any student relevant affairs outside of the Nova email system. And, and part of that is it's, it's for security reasons. We don't you know, want to end up in a situation of where we're sending, we don't know specifically whether you know, you've got a, a, a Gmail account where that's really you or someone pretending to be you, and we don't know what the security of that is, and the university also wants to maintain a record of any sort of communication that, that goes on between the students and the faculty in the event of any disagreements or problems or issues, okay? So it's not an issue we're trying to be, you know, difficult to work with on this. Just be aware it's just it's the way that we have to operate, okay? So we're not going to make a big deal out of it, but it is a big deal, okay? All right, moving forward, um, let's see. All right, I've already mentioned about the e-portfolios, item number four on the agenda. As I mentioned, Wix.com, um, I say start on them now, okay? One of the things that you can do is, as you are going through your courses, and you're coming up with assignments, and you're coming up with projects and papers and whatever else that you're doing, make sure you're saving those, okay? Don't, don't just jettison them, you know, at the end of the semester or whatever. Make sure you're keeping those. And you can go ahead and start creating your Wix site. It's super easy, okay? Those of you that have, have done it, I mean, you guys want to kind of give a, a short little sort of pitch on, on the, using the site? Wix is super user friendly. It's like um, you pick a design and then you just start like uploading whatever information you want to upload or if you have pictures or if you have any videos that you want to add or your assignments, it's super easy, very straightforward, it's not complicated at all. And if you're not used to, like how uh, Dr. Ford, you mentioned, like having a e-portfolio or you don't really know about it, you may want to start just going on there now and just playing around with it until you start having assignments that you can save to upload on there, um, just to kind of get familiar with what button means what, or how do you create your project page and your home page and your about me page and stuff like that, and your videos and stuff like that. It should just be like a, a living document, okay? Think of it like that. You know, it's, it's not ever going to be done, okay? So, you know, you're going to be constantly updating it, constantly adding information, changing information, whatever you need to, you know, not only while you're in the program, but, you know, hopefully you'll use it or um, uh, use a variation of it, you know, after you complete the program. Uh, one thing we're going to start doing, and Ryan is, is working on this now, that's part of the reason for taking pictures of everybody, is on our MSRED website, we're going to have everyone's picture. Next to their picture, we're going to have your bio, okay, like a two to three sentence bio that you're going to write and submit that to, to, to Ryan. And then we're also, for those of you who already have your ePortfolio set up or in progress, we'll have a link to that ePortfolio along with a link to your NOVA email address. Now the one thing to take note of, and I don't know, what, the, the, this, of all the things that, that NOVA does that are potentially problematic, after you finish as a student, you don't have access to your NOVA email address. Why they do that, I don't know, okay? It's, it's just the way they operate, so you need to be thinking about you know, the future in terms of like with your e-portfolio that I have no problem with you putting another email address on there, you know, long term for, you know, use with it. But the, the, the point being is after, I think it's a few months, maybe after you graduate, they pretty much shut off your email account, okay? So I'm just letting you know up, up front that that does happen. And because my personal preference would be that you guys keep that forever and then that was a way for us to be able to stay in contact with you more easily. Well, that having been said, one of the other things that Ryan is working on is he, along with Dr. Wurzer, have set up a LinkedIn account. Okay, you want you guys want to talk about that? All <clears throat> uh, you. It, right now, it's a pretty blank page with just me and Dr. Wurzer. <laughs> uh, well, but, uh, what, what we're looking to do that. is have a, a spot. It's it's going to be a page as opposed to an organization. So it's kind of be a collaborative space where you can network with alumni. You can see who works where. Um, you can kind of post what you're working on. Doctor, uh, I'm active on LinkedIn now that I'm in this role, and I, I like posting about cool things that about Nova and real estate, uh, the Hard Rock. 
story. So anything. Uh, so we, we have our, our local celebrity that was quoted in one of the recent uh, South Florida Business Journal articles about the Hard Rock. Uh, yeah, but who cares about eighteen thousand readers a day? So, <laughs> um, but, uh, so we're doing LinkedIn as the professional platform. Uh, we do have a under the radar Facebook page in case you have seen that. Um, the awkward pictures from the field trips we will post there, as I like, you know what we have done last summer. Um, LinkedIn, <laughs> LinkedIn right now we have uh, for the Terry Stiles School of Real Estate Development, a uh, organizational part, we are going to sublink that on the Nova Southeastern. And uh, Ryan was pushing kind of the idea of having like, a group where you can actually network and interconnect with each other. Yeah? Strongly recommend two things, have a LinkedIn account, and professionally, yeah, and um, because that's how you get reconnected with folks. Like if you get a business card, hey, send them a LinkedIn invite because the business card you might not remember, but LinkedIn you might be able to connect. And um, LinkedIn, no, I forgot that. We'll come back later. Okay. All right. Great. Um, while I'm thinking about it, uh, Dr. Worcher is going to leave us for a few minutes and go downstairs and order our lunches. Um, and then I can say all the things I want to say about him while he's gone. <laughs> about 22 lunches. 22? Yeah, salads and sandwiches, whatever. Okay. A um, couple of other things. Uh, one of the things that um, we also started this year, and a couple of these folks participated in it, you know, sort of midway through the program, is something that we're, we're doing for a variety of reasons, and it's an MSRED comprehensive exam, okay? And the way that we set it up this year, um, it's 40 questions, basically three questions from each of the courses that you would take in the program. Now, one of the handouts that I gave you, one side of it is the uh, one with the border of the Terry Style School, and on the other side is the study sheet that we gave the students this year for the MSRAD comprehensive exam. Now, what this is, it's serving a variety of purposes. Number one, we have requirements from our accrediting bodies that we demonstrate what is referred to as assurance of learning, which basically means that the folks going through your courses actually learn anything, okay, after they've gone through those courses. And to what extent did they learn the things that they were supposed to have learned? Does that make sense? So what we've done in the way that we created the exam is each of the questions, as you can see, there is a quote unquote C level question, a B level question, and an A level question. Now, in a perfect world, the idea would be if you went through the course and you passed the course with a C, you should be able to answer the C-level question without any difficulty whatsoever after having taken that course. Does that make sense? Okay, same thing for the B-level question. If you earned a B or better in the course, more than likely, you should be able to answer that B-level question. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated, a little bit more advanced, okay? And then the A-level question, same thing probably going to be that much more involved, that much more complicated in terms of the, the material that was um, obviously required to be able to sufficiently answer it. Now, those of you that went through the, um, the exam over the past, um, this past week, um, you guys want to say anything about it? What, any of you? I, mean, since I think there's three or four of you. Uh, keep, keep all of your notes. Like I I looked up, I'm like, where were my finance notes, where was my, so once the course passed, I kind of like put, put everything out of my mind, so I had to go back and like find my notes, because I, I, I work best with handwritten notes, and don't sell your textbooks and stuff like that, holds everything, keep everything, just keep it organized, because you're going to need it, whether for later or out of the program, so I was a little bit strange when I trying to figure out. Yeah, you guys can try to be as organized as possible, yeah. especially like the new ones that are like new students that are walking in like next week is your first day of class for anything. Try to keep a binder with, you know, a label for every class that you're taking and take, you know, your notes, detailed notes and just kind of build 
like how you're building your e-portfolio, build your notes. Because you can always refer back to them, and especially with this comprehensive exam, when I heard that we had to do it, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm big on notes, and I'm very organized, so when Dr. Forgy sent us the study guide, I was able to click, like, match everything back up, and it was fine. But when I first heard about it, I was like, this is just ridiculous. <laughs> But it all worked out. So as organized as possible, do that. This is the study guide you got? Well, no. well yeah, yes, yeah. for this year. Now, next year will be a different exam, different study guide. OK. So we, we basically oh, yeah. have to take the exam. Oh, sorry. So when do we take the exam? It will be in August. Well, August next year. Yep. Oh. Yep. OK. At the end of the program. Oh, OK. Unless you're going through halfway through, you potentially could take it early, but you'd be advised to wait and take it your final semester. Okay. And sorry guys, but when you actually like look at this, when it, when he sends this out to you guys, um, if you do have your notes and you are like really involved, as soon as you see something, it'll click to you like mm -hmm. what it means or what you should be answering or how you can elaborate on your answer on that specific question because that happened to, like for me through this entire sheet. I was as soon as I read something, it just clicked. Or you can hear the professor's voice in your ear of the answer from what you guys discussed in class at some point in time. So just yeah, it's, it's not meant to be an exam that's gonna trick you. It's no. not meant to fail you. It's not it's meant to sort of <laughs> as I said, chances are if we were to give the exam to you right now and you have not taken any of our courses, my expectation is you would get very few, if any, of the questions correct. Okay, that's kind of the whole idea. You know, if, if basically you're going through the whole program and you don't know more than whenever you started the program, what's the point of the program? Right? Okay, question? I'm just, um, so you take, so this exam is after like you finish? Everything. Like, so like after your last class or whatever? Correct. Like, so if you're in like a two year program, you may take it. You want to maybe wait until the end of the two years. Thanks. Okay. Is All right. There, yep, sorry. I'm sorry, is there no exam for class? No, no, there are exams yeah. for each of the courses, but this is a way of basically saying, okay, you've done everything. <laughs> you've done everything. Now, did you retain it? I see. Okay, it's been six months since you took the real estate finance course. Do you still remember how to do basically calculating the mortgage payment, calculating an effective yield, calculating an adjustable rate mortgage? And, and if you don't, that tells us yeah. that, that number one, either you really didn't learn it the first time around, or you really didn't care, or you know that we didn't do a good job of, of delivering it, you know, whatever it might be, but that is information for us to be able to take and use. Of course. So, uh, yeah, so. yeah. So it will be something we take home, or is it something we No, no, you do it in class. It's a three-hour exam. Oh, three hours of class. You are allowed to bring all your notes, or you just? No, it's all what you, you have to remember. I mean, the, think of it like this, OK? You go in for an interview mm -hmm. with somebody, all right? And they are one of the, in essence, figure out whether you know what you're, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if all of a sudden they say to you, and it's quite common that you actually have this happen, with, especially with employers with this, this industry, mm -hmm. is they'll say, we need you to go through and do these calculations. Mm -hmm. We need you to demonstrate that you know how to calculate an internal rate of return or a net present value or calculate basically an effective yield or be able to, to figure out how to do an adjustable rate mortgage, or you know, I'm giving you all the finance things, but you need to be able to know how to do those things. And if you don't, that says to them, you don't really know your stuff, okay? So the idea is that this, this should be stuff you should be able to do cold, okay? That's what we can expect to get out of this course, to be yes. able to do that. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, there's a lot more content in each of these courses. Of these are meant to be representative questions of the level of difficulty, you know, because it's, it's sort of like most everyone clearly should be able to hopefully get the C level sort of stuff. But where you differentiate yourself is whether or not you're capable of B level performance or A level performance. And I will tell you that the, within this program, by no stretch of the imagination should you automatically think that you're going to get an A in all of your courses. Okay, we don't have any sort of pre described grade distributions. But you know, this is not a program where we pat people on the back and say, "Good job, thanks for showing up." You know, here's your A. Walk away. You know, kind of thing. So you know, it is a very rigorous program in the sense of, of making sure that people do have competency whenever they leave those courses. Because the last thing in the world that we want to do 
is to put a product out there on the market. In other words, you're a graduate of our program and you basically are showing up with all these A's on your transcript and you go into an interview with, with one of the, the industry leaders and they start asking you questions that are relatively basic questions and you have no clue what you're talking about and we've managed to let you through the program, our credibility is destroyed. Of course. So Plus, I don't want that. Yeah, exactly. None of us do. So that's the point for, you know, obviously, you know, making sure that you are clearly in charge of this information. Okay? All right. No problems? No. Okay. We'll do it that way. All right. So, let's see. All right. Next one. A little bit more fun. All right. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that is available to you, there's another handout entitled, uh, well, it's got actually a map and an itinerary on one side and kind of a, uh, um, a little bit of a description on the, the other side. Something that we started a, a handful of years ago was a real estate sort of focused study tour. It has since morphed into sort of an entrepreneurship focused study tour. And but we still allow our students to go on the study tour and potentially receive three credits as elective credits that replaces one of our courses, okay? So this particular study tour takes place in December of this year, so coming up in a few months, and as you can see, um, has a number of stops along the way, um, in Jamaica, Grand Cayman, Cozumel, and Cuba, okay? And what we do, and the entrepreneurship focused part of this, is that in each of these locations, you're interviewing local entrepreneurs, okay? And talking to them about how did they start the businesses that they started? How did they, basically, what sort of challenges did they in, incur? You know, how do they go about finding their employees? How do they go about doing the market analysis for their businesses? It is not, obviously, inherently real estate focused. It's really more entrepreneurship focused. But as I said, we are allowing our students to participate in this, okay? We actually already have a full group but we are potentially willing to add a few more people. We've got about 34, I think, already signed up for this December. Um, so if you know, any of you potentially want to join, I'm more than happy to, to, to try to you know, help get you in to, to, to join us. Um, all the costing information uh, is here on the sheet. Basically, it's an all-inclusive, if you're a student, 1125, well, that would include your meals, obviously the lodging on board the ship, and any sort of, of transportation necessary while we're in each of these locations. Now, obviously you would need a, tra uh, a uh, passport, um, so you know, if you don't have one, you're gonna need to get one pretty quickly. Um, and then if you do want to actually bring along somebody uh, that's not a student, there is a little bit of an upcharge there of 1325 um, for those folks, yes, do I, have to, do I have to take the uh, credit hours? I was about to mention that. Okay. Because this is, and as I said, not inherently a real estate focused trip. It's more of an entrepreneurship focused trip. If you don't want to do the trip for credit, you can still go, but you still have to obviously pay the, that amount. Now, you're not signing up for a class, right. but you are able to go on the trip. Okay. Does that make sense? Can I still uh, participate? You can. Okay, but now here's the thing. Now, for those of you that want to get the three credit hours, those are you register for a course in winter one of 2019, and so you will have already completed all the requirements during the, the December time frame, and then the, the credit will be awarded and the grade will be awarded in um, basically the winter term. Does that make sense, everybody? As I said, it can replace, and, and, and the normal courses that you would, I mean, not every course is replaceable. The way that we sort of have it set up, if you look on the other side of the, the sheet that has the, well, on the Terry Styles, down toward the bottom, it says electives, choose three of the five. So basically, this would be one of those three of the five. It's, even though it's an ENT prefix, um, those would be where you potentially could um, choose a replacement. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. 
And if you're interested in that, all I need, send me an email and I'll send you the information or the other, like in terms of payment information. The way that we have it set up, you pay a $500 deposit now and then the remainder of 600 and I guess 25 bucks is due, I believe it's September 3rd, okay? And then at that point, we're, we're locked in, ready to go, okay? Now all the rooms are obviously interior rooms. If you want to get an upgrade, there's going to be probably a substantial charge to that, but we need to know that up front, okay? Any questions? Yeah. How do we gain our grade? Do we write a paper? Yeah, okay. So that course, which is pretty much directed by Professor Two Roger, you'll have a handful of books about Cuba, Jamaica, um, and Grand Cayman, um, and Cosmo, um, that you will basically read, and then you will be giving presentations aboard the ship about the readings and about other things that, that sort of being asked. Then you'll also be graded on doing the interviews that you will um, be meeting with the entrepreneurs, typically in groups of four or five people. Um, usually what we like to have in a couple of, obviously, obviously both in Cuba as well as Cozumel, where Spanish is the dominant language, typically want to have a Spanish speaker in each of the groups so that, that you know, have no issues in communication with the folks. Um, and then um, there's also a blog that you would keep basically of photos and other sort of, you know, information you sort of pick up along the way and then post that to the blog. Okay, so in, in terms of, is it a legitimate course? Yes. Is it a really tough course? No. Okay. So anyway, it's a week long trip, or slightly more than a week. I think it's like actually eight days. You might not know this, but is it eligible for the GI Bill? Yeah. <laughs> that I do not know. Honestly, it, it, yeah, but I, I I would assume so, but I don't know. It would be something worth should, uh, asking the question. Should be because it's getting accounted into a retech course. Yeah. But that is a quick email to your financial aid and academic advisor. Okay, good. But it is not a vacation. We make sure you know. Yeah. Now, if you just simply take, if you just simply show up and all you're planning on doing is just no. you know enjoying yourself and not doing the course, then the, yeah, that's that's fine. You can do that. But if you're planning on actually taking the course, <laughs> registering for the course, then they, would, they wouldn't pay if it didn't right. it result in credits. So right. Okay, moving forward. All right, big one. Item number seven, our MSRED advisory board. We have some absolute, now there's no handout for these guys. Um, it's on the website. Um, if you actually go to our website, uh, and you scroll down, and you look at advisory board, pretty much the last item there, it has a listing. Um, of the current members of the advisory board, you can kind of click on any one of those and sort of get a, a sense of who they are, their backgrounds, that sort of thing. These are all folks that have volunteered their time to work with our students in a variety of ways. Number one, they come into class as guest speakers, okay? Number two, they typically help us in terms of setting up site visits with you know different projects that are ongoing. I mean, one of the more recent ones, I guess, was with Styles. You want to talk about that for a couple of seconds and kind yeah. of what that involved? So we did it during the construction management class this summer. We did uh, three field trips. Uh, we started our residential tower development downtown Fort Lauderdale, so-called residences of Las Olas or Rolo. Uh, met with the VP of uh, residential development, VP of construction management, um, the super VP of Styles was as a surprise guest there. So folks that have been in the business 20, 30, 40 years, changing the skyline and the culture of downtown. And uh, what we did is we met them in the construction office, had a quick overview on the project and the philosophy and culture of their company, and then uh, went on the site, um, breaking ground literally first floor, second floor was just sitting, setting up in forms, uh, lots of noise, lots of mud, um, Everyone who went on that trip got a hard hat and a jacket. Um, the second trip we did was with our um, board member Harry Posen, who does like a boutique townhouse, luxury level uh, uh, niche product for sale. As in, he puts 100 units on the, on the market and he pre-sales about 60% of the current project. We had his super and business partner on the site with us 
videotape that as well with YouTube videos. And uh, again, residential, but a different type of residential. And uh, lastly, uh, we have a really great relationship with uh, UN Habitat, or Habitat for Humanity, Broward County. Uh, one of our students is the de land development manager, and prior to that we had been volunteering with them. So we did a site visit. This summer was up the other way around. We did actually volunteer a whole Saturday morning, uh, 100 degrees, blue sky, and we did trussing, aka all those beams in the roof. Yeah, it was lots of fun. You have students in this program who had the first time in their life a hammer and a big nail in their hand, a six inch nail, and hammer their lives. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, and then we met them a few days later, we met them again on uh, the same side, but talked about again the culture, the philosophy of the company, how what kind of great things they do for the uh, community, and how this whole volunteering concept and sweat equity of the owners uh, fit into that. So, this is one of the reasons why I call this a hybrid class, the construction management or construction principles class, um, because it gives the great opportunity to go out into the community to see those sites. Um, that's the reason why we're doing a site visit today as well, after all the orientation and lunch. Great. So another thing about this advisory board, those are a couple of different things we're involved with, but the, the, also a big one is the mentorship program, okay? And this is a huge piece, if you want it to be. Okay, this is one of those things whenever Bruce, who just stepped out for a couple seconds, when the program is all about what you make of it and all about what you put into it, this is definitely one of the big examples of this. You will be paired with a mentor from this list or potentially someone else that um, may be even more appropriate for you based upon what your interest and background and ambitions are. And you will have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with this person throughout your program. Now the way that we typically do this is after you have completed successfully your first course, in other words after the first eight weeks, then you should be getting in contact with me saying, hey, I'm ready for my mentor. All right. And then at that point, we will go through and I will ask you to say, okay, give me your top three choices off of the, the list of the advisory board. or Tell me somebody else within the industry that you are aware of that you might want to potentially serve as your mentor, okay? Now, what happens, and I've got a, a basically a, a, about a 20 or so page handout, mentorship handout that I'll be emailing to you, that kind of has the details as to what you should be expecting. But what you'll be doing with this mentor, initially you'll meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. You'll kind of come up with, you know, sort of your own personal career goals, ambitions, kind of strategies for moving yourself forward, get their feedback, okay? And then over time, the, the relationship potentially like any other sort of relationship is organic, you know, in terms of, of how much time that you spend with each other, talking to each other, keeping in touch with them, okay? Now in the past, we have had situations of where the mentor literally never gets rid of the student. I mean, they will keep them for life, okay, kind of thing. And constantly, after they've completed the program, going back to them, utilizing them, you know, in every which possible way, you know, and that's the extreme, and we love that. We think that's great, okay? That's what we really want to have happen. But on the other end of the spectrum, we may have some folks, number one, who won't even take the initiative to say, hey, I want a mentor. They'll just sit back and say, eh, eh I'm not going to mess with that. Or they'll meet with a mentor once and they'll say, eh, you know. And, and, and so it's, it's the sort of thing that you've got to put some effort into it. Don't expect this mentor, you know, to be calling you up. It's going to have to be pretty much the other way around, or at least initially, all right? And these folks really want to do this. This is not a situation of where they're being forced to do this. They're not being paid to do this. This is something they want to do. Now, most of these people, many of them, are very senior folks. I mean, these are folks, many of them are maybe just even a few years away from retirement, if not almost recently retired. And so this is something they really want to do in terms of giving back to the next generation of real estate developers. And these are very, very well-connected folks, okay? They know everybody, okay? and within the industry. And this industry, 
even though it may seem big, it's a lot smaller than you think in terms of the relationships and the people involved, okay? Um, one of the events that you um, may have the opportunity to go to, I don't have, do we have any spots left on the ULI dinner, Ryan? Yes. How many? Uh, okay, it's gonna be first come, first serve. And I need to talk to you about that. One of the events that's coming up <clears throat> here in another couple of weeks, when, when is it specifically, what day? Uh, the UL, uh, in like the 26th? The Vision Awards is the 30th, is that what you're thinking of? I, yeah, I can't remember the exact date. Uh -oh. August. I believe it's the 30th. Well, anyway, the, the point being is the Urban Land Institute is one of the, the major professional associations here, uh, well, actually across the world, and for real estate development, all forms and matter of real estate development. This once a year awards dinner they do, we buy typically a table each year, it has like 10 seats I think at the table, and we filled up most of the seats already. There's still you know, a couple of seats um, still available. I think we pay about, was it $1,500 for the table or something like that? Two grand. Two grand for the table, okay? So it's not a cheap event. It's a very nice black tie, not mostly black tie, but it's a you know nice event in uh, downtown Miami at the, what, the Marriott? Hey, yeah, okay. Um, and this is the kind of event, if you go to this event, you're gonna meet a lot of people, okay? Uh, they've got an open bar, cocktail hour, you know, before the, the, the dinner starts, and then you've got all these different awards that are giving out to developers from across South Florida. And it's kind of a who's who of major developers. And we typically have a table, as does our competitors down the street and University of Miami and, and Florida International. Um, but the rest of the group are pretty much all A-listers, you know, in real estate development within South Florida. So it's definitely an event that if you have the opportunity to go, you, you should, okay? Um, okay, moving forward. Um, also with the advisory board, another thing with them, some of them really, really, really want to spend even more time with you guys, getting to know you, and what um, a handful of them have suggested that they want to do is do basically some either morning breakfast or lunches where it's three of you and one of them, okay? And so that way it's going to be a little bit less intimidating in, in the sense of you going one-on-one -on -one with some of these folks that you could pick maybe two other folks within the program that you want to, you know, potentially go and have a breakfast or a lunch with. Let me know that you're interested in that and who specifically you would be interested in doing that with and then we'll get that set up. Okay, and actually Ryan will probably be the one ended up setting it up, but nonetheless, we'll get it set up, okay? One thing to remember, these are potential employers after you graduate. So we had this happening in the last two semesters that we actually had a bunch of the board members call us up and say, hey, we have a temporary positioning opening. Uh, we would like to take a look at, let's say, GIS to expand our portfolio. Do you have two or three students that could you recommend? And we actually set up then a session where you sit down with the board member, present your work from this, let's say, GIS class, and have a conversation how that potential employment can work even before you graduate. Yeah. So well, yeah. keep that in mind. And, and they're always asking us, as do other prospective employers, our opinions of the students that are coming to them for potential employment or asking us to recommend students for specific positions, okay? So you be very conscious, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but of your behavior and your performance in the classroom. That if you're rude, obnoxious, you don't show up, you show up late, you turn in horrible assignments, you don't prepare, what kind of recommendation do you think you're going to get from the faculty, okay? Now, that's not meant to be a threat. That's meant to just be honest. That you need to really think about, you know, putting your best efforts forward, okay? And that, that should go for anyone. And that should always be the norm. But, you know, in some instances, you know, we've had some of the students that go through the program, they don't finish the program, but they maybe start the program, and within a, a semester or so, they're out of the program because they can't handle the work. Okay? It's not that we're trying to make it excessively hard, but it is a time commitment. It is you know, a, a relatively rigorous curriculum that you know, you're being asked to complete. And those folks that are obviously midstream through the program can attest to that. Okay? All right? But they're also going to tell you we're not bad people. 
we're not trying to, to, you know, inherently trying to get rid of you or fail you or not let you through the program. That's not the point. But if you're consistently not showing up for class, consistently not turning in assignments or turning them in late and plagiarizing, um, you know, that's a, you know, I want to let Dr. Wurzer talk about that. That's one of his favorite topics of talking about the whole plagiarism thing. So. <laughs> All right. Um, let's start in a positive way. I have a PhD in regional planning. I have been, I'm a geographer born educated in South Germany. Yeah? I teach, I educate, entertain, and inspire. I put a lot of energy and a lot of fun in my, into my classes. Yeah, there's a lot of workload. I did get the uh, nickname in one class as Dr. Death because apparently, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. There are worse things than that. It's actually a thank you. Okay. I expect a lot of hard work from you guys and I dedicate my hard work into the same way for your education. One thing people think is, ha, ah, so German, South German, sense of humor. There's zero sense of humor when it comes to plagiarism and cheating. Let that sink in. Late submissions, I abandoned that. If a Friday 8 p.m. deadline is set in a class, it's 8 p.m., not 8.05, not midnight. Yeah? Why is there a Friday 8 p.m. deadline, let's say for the site planning class? Because I want to see what you have done in your work for the next session, because I probably pull that site, that site planning sketch you made as an assignment up on a PowerPoint and have you as like a criticism session in class, a learning experience, discuss what have been your thoughts about those 50 little red dots you put up. Yeah. And while you're on the, on the topic of deadlines, let's just put it, maybe we'll come back to, to another piece. Think of it like this. It's not an issue of we're trying to punish people, but it's, it's a fairness issue. If we set a deadline of 8 p.m. on Friday, and you just for whatever reasons and you have a bad day, you're not able to get to it, and then all of a sudden you say, okay, I'm going to submit it at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, or the next day, or whatever, and you expect you know, everybody to just sort of say, okay, that's fine, that's probably not going to happen because that's not fair to the other people in the class. You know, if you got an extra hour, an extra two hours, an extra day, how is that fair to them without getting some sort of a penalty attached to it? Okay. Another way of looking at it, even beyond the fairness to your fellow students, is think of it like this. If you're a developer and there is a request for proposals from, let's say, a local government or from some other sort of entity, and they say the deadline is 5 p.m. on Friday afternoon, do you think they're going to accept it? at 501? No. That's the deadline. That's when it's due. Much like your taxes are due on April the 15th, you know, as a as a general rule, unless you have some other, you know, extensions for other reasons. But my point being is just be aware of that. Don't don't try to make a not try to make a big deal out of it, but it, we'd rather have this conversation up front yeah. than to have it, you know, as you're midway through a class or a program and you know you're, you're struggling and and um you know but let us know for example if, if there's something that's come up and you're not going to be able to complete it by the deadline we're going to be a lot more willing to work with you if you tell us that beforehand okay than if you wait until after the deadline has passed and, and effectively tell us okay. so that's a keep well kept secret we are humans too yeah so all this deadline talk means if you happen to take, have a car accident and you're in the hospital, at some point of time, send an email and say, hey, medical emergency. Yeah? If your spouse is giving birth, medical emergency. There are certain things we cannot control in life. Okay? But just because you didn't remember and didn't submit on time, zero tolerance. I tried Canvas, this is on the talking points, Canvas is the new learning environment we have as a platform, Form, uh, black, uh, Blackboard was the former thing. Canvas has a calendar function. You can put that calendar on your computer, on your phone. Yeah? If you use Outlook or something like this, you can pull that in. There's zero excuse of, oh, I did not know about that deadline. Why? Because all those deadlines have been put in last night. So if you take a class, or any of the three classes of mine right now, by the latest on Monday morning, those deadlines should be on your calendar. Print it out on a piece of paper. Put it on your desk. Put it on the refrigerator. 
Tell your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever who else is in your life controlling your time management, tell them about the deadlines. Write that down right now. The week that ends with Saturday, September 22nd. Don't take date nights. That's exam week. Yeah? I'm giving two midterms that Saturday. So take a breath. Everyone will survive. All right, speaking of survival, plagiarism, cheating. It starts with, oh, I wrote this great paragraph last semester in the one seminar paper. I'm copying and pasting this over. That's self-plagiarism. You can fail the assignment for that because you copied content from another class into your own work, even if it was your own work. Yeah? If you go out to Wikipedia, oh, the sentence is really great. Grab it. Wikipedia is not a source. If you grab this, copy and paste in your assignments or your quizzes, it's plagiarism cheating. Yeah? Remember that. My syllabi have a long explanation on this. The university has a long explanation like this. I have a certain rule that if I find you cheating in one of the assignments, I go through all the work you have done in that specific class. And I'm really good at that. That's the reason why he's asking me to give you that talk. I have zero tolerance to give you that F and execute university protocol and procedures. In the worst case, I lose you as a student in the whole program. Zero tolerance. Because if you're putting somebody else's work out there, or you're once again you're self-plagiarizing. I mean that it's it's just it's not appropriate and it's not a reflection of, of what you should be doing. Period. So. The trick on this, or the tricky part of plagiarism, is how to is to know how to deal with other people's <coughs> ideas, text, and literature. And there are books written about that. We have workshops in the library. Um, I strongly recommend that that you actually go to the writing center and say, hey, if I have to write a short memo or using different sources, like a breakdown of a specific county in real estate market analysis, you're going to write about two different counties you never have experienced probably in your life. <laughs> Copy and pasting from the introduction web page of that county is plagiarism. But there are ways to cite and paraphrase the proper way according to certain writing styles and um, schemes, APA 6 as an example. Yeah? That's a standard on how to say, hmm, 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 apprentices, good, that's what, uh, to, to 2018. Yeah? It's a little extra effort you have to put in in writing and giving credit where credit is due to other people. A simple example, I have a dream. It's a statement, a quote, everyone understands. This is somewhat common sense. You don't have to present that as, this was the person, this was the date, this was the location. Yeah? But if you cite something from Miller 2017 and it's a 500 page book and nobody really knows about that, you might want to show that in a reference list at the end and say, I got this from Mr. Miller. Yeah? I'm more than happy to help. But as you can see, don't, don't, as I said, you don't view this as being a, a nasty, vindictive sort of thing. This is simply just preparation so that you don't get caught in that sort of a circumstance. That's all we're trying to do, okay? Because we would much rather say all this up front and be a little bit negative up front as opposed to, as I said, you're midway through a class and all of a sudden you get an assignment returned to you with an F on it because of plagiarism, okay? All right. When in doubt, ask yep. about it. Okay. It's serious stuff. It's really serious stuff. Okay, we've already gone through a number of these other things. Um, so that number eight, we talked about that, making sure you get your, your email set up on your phone. Class attendance issues, I've already kind of mentioned that a little bit, that obviously it's absolutely imperative that you do make every effort to be here for every class session and be on time, okay? Um, one of our instructors, just to kind of use him as an example, Professor Sam Miguel, those of you that took him this summer, um, he is a bit extreme as it relates to the, the whole attendance thing in the sense, if you're not there, at the beginning, at 8 o'clock in the morning, you get points deducted. If you leave early, you get points deducted. Okay? If you're not there at all, you get many more points deducted. So much so that 40% of your grade is based on just attendance. Now, you might say that, well, that seems like he must have an awfully easy class if he's willing to give away 40% for just class attendance. 
Not at all. It's that the other 60% is tough work, okay? And that's a way of him kind of helping to, to, to balance things out a little bit. Would, would you disagree? It was, hard. it was my first class in the program. It was hard. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's a tough one. Okay? It's a tough one. But, but, but having just said that, every class is different. Every single course is different, even between instructors and, and, and within instructors. So, you know, I teach typically four or so of the courses in the program, the real estate finance, real estate investments, real estate financial modeling, the e-portfolio, and now the real estate development process two course. And I will tell you, like the real estate finance course and the real estate investments course, one hundred percent of the grades in those courses are based on calculations and calculations alone. You will not have to write a single word in my class other than your name, okay? Everything else is 100% calculation based, okay? But then other courses like the ePortfolio course, there's not a single calculation, okay? And in the, the Real Estate Development Process 2 course will be a project we will have, yes, a lot of words, a lot of calculations, presentation, and so forth so on. Does that make sense? In your Real Estate Law course, well, you've got two different law courses. Neither of those two courses, to my understanding and recollection, has a single calculation in them. It's all writing, okay? It's all reading. So if, when I say everything is different from one course to the next, it is because there are different skill sets involved with all of this material. And those of you that have taken multiple courses, you know what we're talking about when we say that. Yeah. Okay? All right, moving forward. Um, one of the things that we do do is for each of the courses, we videotape, just like we're doing today. And what we do is we pop them up on our website, which is, or actually not our website, but our YouTube site, which is simply MSRED. So all you have to do is go into YouTube, up in the subject line, just simply type in MSRED space REE, -E, and the first thing it will pull up is our basically site. We've got obviously about almost a thousand subscribers, but I think, and I don't know if it has it listed there, but we've also got close to a thousand videos, okay? And these are the videos from the past three years or so of the program for virtually every single course, okay? So that you could, theoretically, you know, if you're really worried about my real estate finance class, you're saying, oh, I'm horrible with numbers, and I just, you know, this sort of stuff just makes me sick to my stomach, you know, thinking about and doing these calculations, you can actually pull the videos from last year, watch them before coming into class, and be that much more prepared coming into class, along with looking at Carlos's notes, as I showed you on, uh, on <laughs> online, okay? Um, but the, the, the point being, is this is a great resource. And the reason we started doing this um, was a couple different reasons. Number one, if a student had to miss a class, this is a way for you to be able to basically go back and see what actually took place during that class so that hopefully you wouldn't be as far behind as you would be not having been there at all, okay? Second reason was, all right, you're going through a class like the Real Estate Finance course, and you're saying, he went through that so fast, and I was writing down everything he was saying, and I just didn't quite grasp that particular concept or that particular calculation. You can pull up the video, rewatch it, and, and say, oh, okay, now I understand I missed that step. Okay, I'm good to go, okay? Also, it has been, strangely enough, um, a good way for us to be able to promote certain aspects of the program and sort of when people ask about what the program is like in many cases we'll shoot them a couple of the videos and say here take a look at this and sort of see what the program is all about and, and get you know some sort of perspective. Strangely enough you know on some of these videos we have literally had thousands of views um, on some of these pictures. You mind shut the door? I think it's is that also do you? Yeah. Somebody go put out one of the doors I shouldn't have. Um, so, but anyway, so the videos are there. It's a great resource, okay? Now, some people do ask the question of like, well, why am I paying all this tuition if I can get online and watch all these videos online? Well, think about it. You could do that. 
But number one, you're not going to get the feedback from the instructors. You're not going to have the interactive experience within the program. You're not going to have access to the advisory board. You're not going to, to obviously be tested and, and poked and prodded with respect to all of the assignments that you're going to be doing. So yeah, you can do all that as much as you can buy a textbook, go through a textbook and, and work through every single problem in the, in the book and potentially gain knowledge you know, that way. So think of these as just simply an additional resource for the program. Okay, any questions about it? Okay, moving forward. Um, we're talking about the plagiarisms, we can get past that. Canvas, do you want to say anything about Canvas specifically? No. No, oh, well, yeah. Um, so again, we have a new system, it's called Canvas. Uh, as 10.15, 10.16, and 10.17, you should all have received for the three classes in info. Uh, Canvas is found as nsu.instructure.com. Uh, it's very mobile friendly, so you can really skim this through on your phone with the app or not, or even with a mobile browser. Um, I like it. It's in interesting in terms of analytics and the student support. Um, there are interactive chat sessions in there. I can actually switch the screens with you. So say for the Argus class in winter, if you are sitting in Boca Raton, you don't have to come down in, phys in physical presence to the office hours. We can have an internet web chat and I can see your screen. I can talk you through what's the problem with that. So this is a very cool feature. Uh, it's, it has a discussion board, it has a really, really nice calendar function. I really appreciate that. Um, with one mouse click, if I don't forget, I can remind everyone, hey, you haven't submitted your um, assignment yet. I usually do that with like a 48 hour warning time because even with the calendar, with the printout on your desk, you might forget. <coughs> yeah. And the last thing I want in my classes is people stressing out about deadlines. They're all known far, far in advance and you realize within a week what kind of philosophy and workload you will have to expect for that. So there's no real secret about that and open communication. In all the classes I encourage to do um, discussion board, emails, I respond within six hours to four, 24 hours usually. I'm done with the six minutes response at 3 a.m. is probably not going to happen. Um, but I really like to have you be engaged. Look at uh, around you. New people, older people you met before in other semesters. We are doing teamwork classes, we're doing projects. You work in different classes and study groups. So this is a cohort, this is a team. Yeah? So act as one. No one competes about a grade in this program. Yeah? Don't forget that. We all don't want, or can't say we all want to be winners or something. <coughs> so Canvas um, is a little bit new. I will give you for the probably for the real estate marketing analysis class, which is the most intense work because it's an online class. I give you a quick overview on the items on Canvas. It's simply built as in to, to your left is the menu with the courses, a dashboard. I try to put pictures up on the dashboard so you can see, hey, this is a GIS class, this is market analysis, um, and the other classes. So it's really intuitive, easy to handle. If you had in your prior programs uh, Blackboard, it's way better than Blackboard. Yeah? Um, again, communication functions are really great. I like the calendar. Um, content is easily sorted. There are modules you can do, assignments. Um, on one note, if you are looking at classes of larger assignments, with multiple assignments, I at the end download this and run it through Excel. Yeah? So your 90 point total in the calculations on Canvas might not be that 90 point you'll get. It might be 91. Yeah? Something, like to, something to remember. Again, um, response time, we are really active. He is more the morning person, I'm working late night. Um, so communication, 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 and everyone here who had class with us can confirm that. Um, you get, when we do a field trip, you get my personal cell phone number. Um, so if you're stuck in the traffic, boom, you can uh, hit me up with that. Please don't call at 3 a.m. in the morning about a grade, uh, or within 24 hours of a submission. I'm really, really getting a little cranky. 24 hours before submission, you had six weeks to work on this, you know. Um, it's just bad mojo. 
Yeah, and as he said, I mean, actually, and it is quite accurate. I'm the kind of guy that many days I will be here at the office by about 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, okay? But then I also leave about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, okay? He usually gets here about 11 o'clock you know, in the morning, and then we'll maybe be here until 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. So that we do have different schedules, so be aware of that. And you know, they're not to say that we're not available at other times, but in terms of our normal sort of rhythm of kind of getting things done, it seems to work best, okay? Um, and we both obviously are available via you know, text message, phone, yeah. that sort of thing. Okay. He's pretty much office hours every morning. I have office hours Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, three till five. If you want to meet in person, besides phone, email, chat, three till five p.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays this semester, my time, I will be available. If you can't make that, we will find a way to do that. Yeah, like I have internship classes, I do that by appointment. So the next item on the agenda is kind of a fun one. Um, asked, uh, Angelo, one of our uh, students in the program, he put us in contact with a company this past uh, semester called Vizda.com, and it's a relatively new online database um, up to the minute, literally, of, of sales information and historical information, predominantly about commercial properties here within South Florida. Um, has some amazing resources in terms of being able to pull up government documents about planning zoning changes, as well as the sort of the sales information, ownership information, that sort of thing. It is, believe it or not, free to you as students going through the program. The normal cost, I'm trying to remember now, is like... I think 250 a month. Yeah, 250 bucks a month or something like that. So going through the program, you know, it's a nice little benefit to, to receive. And the owner of the company came and, and, and met with me over the course of summer. And, you know, and I was saying, okay, look, do we want, you know, what kind of relationship do we want to have here? Do you want the folks to limit their use of this exclusively to, you know, working on their classes and, and that sort of thing and not use it for any sort of, you know, personal or professional use? And he was like, no, go ahead and, and let them use it for, you know, professional use if they, they need to. Show it off to everybody. And part of the reason for that is much the same reason Many of the software companies tend to operate kind of like that or information systems companies because you as students are the future users of these products and they basically operate like drug dealers, okay? <laughs> and they basically get you hooked on the product and then once you're hooked on the product, yeah. you're never going to get off the product, okay? And so the, when it comes to the, uh, many of these sort of software things, you're going to love a lot of them and you're going to say, after you finish the program, we want to make sure we have access to this and use this in whatever business that we've got. So with that, I'm going to sort of turn it over to Angelo just to kind of walk you through a couple of little examples of how easy it is to use and, and what it's all about. Sure thing. So um, Chris Thompson, he's the, he's the uh, owner and founder of it. He's uh, based out of, I think, uh, Arizona, yeah. right? Yeah, and they came down here. This is their second market that they've expanded into. Um, I, I'm a practitioner broker. Um, I'll show you the practical side of this because ultimately the objective is to, you know, get you to see the value in it. There, there's like three different things I'd say off the bat. One, um, it's faster than CoStar. The average I've seen is about 11 days. The information comes up faster whenever land has changed hands or the buildings changed hands. Okay, that's not really the value prop. The speed's one thing which can give you an edge. But two, if there's zoning changes, okay, if an area's zoning has been changed, for those of you who have been through those, that coursework and those of you that will be going through it, you'll understand the value of knowing that timely information, especially if you're representing your clients in the area, okay? So I'm gonna run through an example here. This is a basic map. I mean, the, the search on it couldn't be easier. It's, it's Google Maps, you know, overlay here. Here's their filter, really simple. I'll show you the way that I, that I use it. Uh, specifically, I do industrial. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and remove the planning zoning. And then I'm gonna look, you know, let's see. We'll start a year ago, right? to today. 
Thank you. There we go. All right. Let's see if it works. All right. So in the last year, this is what's happened. Now, if you wanted to drill it down further so it's a little more timely, which is typically what I would do. I'm going to look from, you know, May of this year. All right. So obviously there's a lot of transactions happening, right? Okay. So what I do is I'm going to drill in. This is Davy, right? We're somewhere like around here, right? Somewhere? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to open this one up. Let me show you what this report looks like. Okay, the fact that you know the transaction happened, that's easy. You can go to the courthouse, you can find that out, public records, etc. right? The part that saves you time, because you can go through the entities and you can find the ultimate owners, right? That takes time, though. They've done it for you. Wow. It's right there. When it changed hands, those are the parties, there's their contact information. What it changed hands for what the building is, okay? The way that we implement this in practice, right, is if I have something listed and I see something hit, which this is moving again 10 to 12 days faster than CoStar, right, which is what the majority of the market uses, if you're not aware, um, I see that they've been buying. I'm going to call the buyer and I'm going to ask, do you have additional appetite for this type of property? And I don't have to do anything but log in and look. Now, that, again, that's just a, an application of the brokerage side. Obviously, for developers, if you've got, you know, um, competing interests with, with your, um, you know, pals in the industry, you can track specific zip codes, and whenever they change, you'll get an email alert immediately. Say the zoning changes. Oh, that just moved over to office. Okay. Well, my client's got a lot there. <coughs> well... What's the zoning? How dense is it? Now how valuable is it versus five minutes ago? So that's that's the application. And then, <clears throat> I don't know if that one has anything or not, but but also usually if um, any sort of uh, you know, other documents that it may have. Mm -hmm. It'll tell you if it's like, okay, so like the, There's the deed. You can pull up and actually see the actual copy of the deed. I mean, you, and same sort of thing with any sort of, of local government planning request and, and zoning changes, all of that would be there as well. So it's just, it's an amazing repository of information. And obviously the reason we're showing it to you is this is going to be a great resource to be able to use in the program as you're, you're going through and, and collecting information. Yes? How do we gain access to this? You that said? is next. Oh, okay. Yeah. So basically Ryan will be collecting information from you in terms of kind of uh, your number one, your interest, but also um, getting the account set up with Vista, and, and like I said, it'll be a free account um, that will be typically one year in duration. Okay. So Ryan is the new archer. Ryan is the new archer. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we've got most of these things. Okay. Next one, the YOLO invite. Okay. So Ryan, tell us a little bit about that event and kind of what's going on there. YOLO is our first and only advisory board alumni student meeting of the year. It's over at a very nice old lounge attached to YOLO, which is actually in the shadow of the Styles uh, corporate headquarters. Um, it is highly recommended, if not urged strongly, to recommend in terms of being at this event because of who's going to be there, our alumni, and uh, I. It's, it's basically it's, it's a it's a it's a nice opportunity. You you don't have to get super dressed up, but you know once again, kind of the whole business casual kind of thing. You're not going to show up in t-shirt and flip flops, okay? Um, you know it's an evening event. Typically, you know, this year I think we've set it from like five thirty to eight o'clock. Um, are most of you familiar with Yolo is in downtown Fort Lauderdale? If you're not, it's really in the heart of downtown, right on East Los Olos Boulevard, and we'll obviously be sending you the precise address and that sort of thing. Um, but it's a, it's a kind of event, it's a come and go kind of, of event. Um, we'll be issuing free drink tickets 
Um, there'll be appetizers, you know, that sort of thing. But it's a great way for you to be able to kind of get to mix and mingle, not only with your current group of students, but also alumni of the program, as advisory board members of the program, faculty from the program, and we typically will invite some prospective students to the, the event as well. So um, it usually can be a, a pretty decent sized event in terms of the folks that are there. Um, and it's exclusively affiliated with our program. So we've been doing this now for about four years and it's been a great success every time we do it. Everybody loves it, um, but it does cost us a fair amount of money to do it. So that's one of the reasons we only do it typically once a year, okay? Um, or at least that kind of an event, once a year. Okay, um, next item on the agenda, organizational memberships. UOI, Urban Institute, NAOP, National Association of Industrial Office Properties, ICSC, International Council of Shopping Centers, and NAHB, the National Association of Home Builders. These are four of several different um, professional associations that are available to you with student memberships. Now, what we are doing this year is we are asking you to pick one of these or potentially another one that might be even a more interesting. Another one that I, I, I did leave out, um, unfortunately, is CRU. Um, the, it's basically commercial real estate for, is it? For women or of women, but in essence, obviously, a, a female dominated um, uh, professional association that they have some amazing events um, and great connections. Uh, so, you know, that would be another one. And, and obviously, Ryan, you've got another one that you've been going to recently. The, uh, yeah, there's a, a CIASF. I, I went to, I mean, there's ULI events. Anything that, that you've heard of that I may not have. Uh, just bring it, bring it to me, and we'll do a feasibility. I'll, I'll go to the events with you. Yeah, uh, I'm in the same state. You and we pay. will pay for right. the right. membership in one of the We're not going to pay for all of them, but you need to pick one that you think that you're going to have the most interest in. And what I would advise you to do, you say, well, which one should I pick? Which one should I pick? Go to their websites. You know, go and see what they're all about, because each one kind of has a different sort of specialty. If you're interested in shopping centers and retail. ICSC is the group for you. But if you have zero interest in retail, there's no way, there's no reason for you to go to ICSC, okay? None, all right? But if your interest is home building and you want to become a home builder, the National Association of Home Builders is the organization to, to be considering. You, you sort of follow what I'm saying? All right, so now ULI, the Urban Institute, is kind of the one organization that tends to encompass most everything. So if, if I had to say the one organization that kind of has everything, it would be ULI, okay? Um, now, am I, is, is that me saying to you, you should go and, and ULI should be your organization? No, <laughs> I'm saying it could be because it's probably the most comprehensive, but if you really have a, a subspecialty that you're hardcore about, you know, one particular property type, then you might want to explore one of the others. It's a bit more narrow. Okay. Now, usually, even with these the student organizations, um, within these, you know, the membership fees, you know, they vary a little bit, but usually like between twenty-five to hundred bucks a year for the student memberships. Okay, for if you are a person off of the street wanting to join, in most cases, more than a thousand bucks a year. Okay. So that's the thing that you know, you've got to take advantage of this time that you are a student because you can get those memberships for next to nothing, okay? Because once again, they want to hook you just like the drug dealers, okay? You know, they want to get you into their organization so that you'll be there with them, okay? Um, but now you're saying, well, what's the point of these professional associations? Okay, this is in many cases where a lot of the job opportunities pop up, okay? Because you're meeting people at these events that they throw. They have young leaders association kind of, of meetings that typically are people under the age of 40. They've also got, you know, other events that they throw all throughout the year focused on maybe different projects or, or different parts of town, whatever it might be. And it's your opportunity to go and network with these folks. This is where many of the job opportunities are going to be made available. It's, it's going to be who you know within the industry, okay? Um, and very much of a word of mouth kind of situation. A lot of the development companies don't necessarily 
do the traditional kind of put an ad in the newspaper or an ad on Monster or an ad on you know Indeed.com or whatever, many of the times they don't even post the positions. They are talking to people constantly and saying, well, who do you know that might be able to, um, um, who do you know that might be able to fill this position that has this kind of skill set? Okay, well, that's where these professional associations come into play. But make sense? Okay, all right, moving forward. We're almost done. And then lunch. Um, okay, we are going to the LinkedIn account. Photos, we've done most of your photos. If we haven't done your photo, we'll do that real quick um, here in a couple of minutes. Um, and then let, let uh, Wartcher here talk about your lab fees for the GIS and Argus. And then the final thing, um, uh, uh, Ryan can talk to you about the ID cards and, and parking pass. And then after that, we're ready for lunch. Okay? So, uh, Dr. Wartcher, you want to talk to him real quickly about the lab fees? All right. Um Exciting news, you might have read your email while you have been in this meeting. Um, we do have a new licensing model with the university and ESRI. ESRI, some people know, some people might not know, is the company that does GIS, Geographic Information Systems. Or the coolest thing on earth you can imagine about your education. Um, I get excited about that stuff. He really does. <laughs> <laughs> really excited about it stuff, um, keeps me awake since more than 20 years, paid for two college degrees, so enough said. Since the last two years I've been working on to get a more streamlined and organized, managed licensing model here for this university. Baby steps. One major baby step is we are now able to give you a full-blown crazy account, not just limited account for the online world. This book is pushing the internet-based, <coughs> web-based GIS more and more. So that means instead of, let's say, 400 or 500 online credit points, think about like a um, prepaid credit card, you have $500, yeah? The last classes I taught, I had like a budget for four to 500 points per student. With the new licensing model, I can offset a few other costs but we have to have a kind of GIS lab fee, software fee for maintaining variable costs on that with the great benefit that I will be able to give you three to 5,000 points for a fraction of what you would pay on the regular market if you would buy that outside of education. Give you an idea. Last summer, 1,000 points was a $100 fee on the regular market. I'm aiming between three and five thousand points for with that lab fee imposed on this class right now. The lab fee is what? Fifty bucks. Fifty bucks. Yeah. yeah. That said, I'm managing all the GS licensing for the university. Real estate students will maintain their account after they have done this class. So it's not a lab fee for five, eight, ten weeks and you're done with it. No. My goal is for a year, I maintain your account with these points on it. That means you can do all the other exercises in the World Wide Web, business analysts as an example, drive time analytics, retail analytics, where people live, what they eat, where is disposable income, all the crazy variables of socioeconomics you will be exposed in multiple, multiple classes you can use. The real estate marketing uh, market analysis class is 16 weeks long. The second part of that class, you can use your GIS skills to do the final assignment as an example. And you don't have to worry about to blast through points. I had a student who came up with the idea for his GIS project to digitize or geocode all building permits for Miami-Dade County. 775,000 data points. And I was able to support that guy because I had some extra leftover points. Now, no discussion. You can do that. You can do that five, six times before you have to send me an email. Mm, something went wrong. Yeah. So, very exciting news. Very thrilled um, about that. In combination with, let's say, a discounted textbook, you're still at the same price when you buy, um, if you, let's say, go to Amazon, get the rebated book. Save the money on for the app fee. 
Yeah? It's a high value added item to your education. That's about it. Okay. You received the link. We are running this through Marketplace. It's a super easy um, way. Just click on the link, say one item only, choose on the next page what college you are in, HCBE, not Harmos, not others, HCBE, and I should get a link the moment you process this payment and I will set you up. I will not set you up within 24 hours this time because I got the license yesterday. So I need like three or four days to get you running. You will have access before the class starts. Yeah? Again, this is super exciting stuff. This keeps me awake in a positive way. And um, that's kind of the spirit how I teach that class. All right, Ryan, real quick about how they go about getting their ID cards and parking passes. In no way, shape, or form I actually teach, but I did get mine recently. That's my <laughs> ass. So there's a first uh, time student a checklist if you haven't got it from your official recruiter <coughs> send you an email it's, it really spells out from shark mail to id cards to um your parking pass that's all in the port yeah, port it's port it's port one stop port shop port. on the first floor yeah you have already done it just, just a, across the uh, the campus across the pond yeah. um <laughs> we can probably pop a map up of the, yeah. the campus i, I can show, show them that but uh, that's it. Um, hopefully um, that was useful. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So go up here, grab a sandwich, grab some chips, grab a drink, and um, hang out here. And then we'll probably about 12.45. Then we'll get out of here and go to our site visit um, just adjacent to campus.